Let us pray. Almighty God and our Heavenly Father, we come to Thee again. We come to offer our worship and our praise and our thanksgiving. We come, O Lord, to seek that blessing without which all we do we know is in vain, and especially when we handle Thy Word and these most holy things. So we pray Thee to look upon us and bless us this afternoon as we consider together this vital and all-important work of preaching the good news of salvation in Thy dear Son. Hear us, O Lord, as we come, pleading nothing but His name and His merit, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'd remind you hurriedly of the point at which we've arrived, having considered the objections to preaching. We are now considering exactly what preaching is, and I've suggested that there are two elements. There is the sermon itself, then there is the delivery of this sermon. So we are starting with the sermon, and I've suggested that this again should be considered from two aspects. First, the content of the sermon, and secondly, the form of that content or that message. With regard to the content, we've said that it uh, is that uh, which we have received. We don't voice our own opinions or our own ideas. It's such as I have give I thee. It's the word which is clearly divided into two main sections, the message of salvation and teaching, bringing people to a first knowledge of God in Christ and then building them up in this their most holy faith. But I did suggest that that second division perhaps should be subdivided into two. One is the more experimental side where you're dealing more with the difficulties and the problems of the members of the church. And the more general teaching, where your message is more instructional and not so much concerned with practical difficulties and problems or states and moods and conditions of the soul. So that, if you like, we might say that there are three main types of messages which uh, the preacher has to prepare. Well, now then, I want to emphasize here that while I do regard these divisions, or distinctions rather, as important, I must stress the fact that they're not absolute distinctions or divisions. Their importance is mainly one of practical value. It's uh, good for the preacher himself that he should have this kind of division of his matter in his mind and it is also of course good for the people. What I mean by that is this, that preaching which is nothing but evangelistic is obviously inadequate. Preaching on the other hand which is never evangelistic is equally inadequate and so on. So that this is a good practical kind of division and distinction to hold in one's mind. but. What I am emphasizing is that all these three are always interrelated and interdependent. And here arises a most important matter. How is this interrelationship between these three types of preaching to be preserved? And I suggest that the way to answer that question is to realize the relationship between theology and preaching. So I would lay down a general proposition that preaching must always be theological, always based on a theological foundation. In other words, we mustn't preach at random from isolated texts uh, and deal with each one separately. The reason for that is, of course, that the kind of preacher who does that is always guilty of contradictions. Uh, he delivers a message on the basis of one text, but because it isn't related to others and to the whole truth, when he comes to deal with another text, he may say something that contradicts what he said in the first sermon, and this frequently happens. So I say the way to avoid that and to maintain and preserve this interrelationship between these types of preaching is to be always theological. There is no type of preaching 
that should be non-theological, uh, the form of the type of preaching that is sometimes, and indeed very frequently today, regarded as non-theological, uh, non is evangelistic preaching. You must have encountered a good deal of this uh, as we have. I remember very well when a campaign was being held in London a few years back, uh, one of the liberal religious weeklies was supporting this campaign and said, let's have a theological truce while the campaign is on. Then after that, of course, we must then think it out and become theological. The idea was that uh, in evangelism, you have no theology and you don't need any. Uh, you bring people to Christ, as they put it, and then you teach them, and it is there that theology comes in. Now, that to me is... Uh, quite uh, wrong and almost monstrous. I would have argued that in many ways evangelistic preaching should be more theological rather than less theological than any other. And for this good reason. Uh, why is it that you call upon people to repent? Why do you call upon them to believe? You can't deal with that without dealing with the doctrine of men, the doctrine of fall, of the fall, doctrine of sin. You call them to come to Christ and to give themselves to him. Well, how can you do that without knowing who he is? And on what grounds you invite them to come to him? And so on. In other words, it is all highly theological. Uh, evangelism, which is not theological, is, in my opinion, not evangelism at all, in any true sense. It's a calling for decisions. It may be a calling of people to come to religion or to live a better kind of life. But it cannot, by any definition, be regarded as Christian evangelism. Because, as I've said, there is no reason for what you're doing apart from these great theological principles. So I'm asserting that every type of preaching must be theological, including evangelistic preaching. But at the same time, it's vital to assert that preaching is not lecturing on theology or any aspects of theology. I'll take this up later on in dealing with general definitions here. Well then, if I say that it isn't that it's got to be theological, and yet it is not uh, lecturing on theology. What is the relationship between uh, preaching and theology? I would put it like this, that the preacher is a man who must have a grasp, and a good grasp, of the whole biblical message. And this message, of course, is a unity. So what it leads to is this, that he is a man who should know his biblical theology, which leads him on to a systematic theology. To me, there is nothing that is more important in a preacher than that he should have a systematic theology, that he should know it and be familiar with it. Uh, the reason being this, that this systematic theology, this body of truth, which is derived from the scripture is something that should be always present as a background and as a controlling influence in his preaching. Each message which arises out of a particular text or statement of the scripture must always be a part or an aspect of this whole total body of truth. It's never something in isolation, never something separate or apart. Uh, so I say that uh, the doctrine in a particular text, we must always remember, is a part of this whole doctrine. And that's the meaning of a phrase like comparing scripture with scripture. We don't deal with texts in isolation. All our preparation of the sermon is controlled by this background of systematic theology. 
because it's necessary to issue a warning at this point. It is wrong for a man to impose his system violently on any particular text. But at the same time, it is vital that his interpretation of any particular text should be checked and controlled by this system, this body of doctrine and of truth which he holds. I trust I'm making this relationship plain and clear. There is a danger that some men uh, with a systematic theology, uh, which they hold very rigidly, impose this wrongly upon particular texts and have to twist those texts. In other words, they are not actually deriving their particular doctrine from the text with which they're dealing at this point. The doctrine may be quite right, but they're not getting it from this particular text. And you must always be textual. So I'm, that's what I mean by not imposing your system upon a particular text or statement. But the place of systematic theology is that when you arrive, as you think, at your doctrine from your particular text, you check it and you control it by discovering that it does fit into this whole, this body of doctrine which is to you vital and essential. In other words, I am contending for this, that our primary call is to deliver this whole message, this whole counsel of God, and uh, that this is always more important than the particulars, or the particular parts and portions. Perhaps I can put it like this to you, by reminding you that it was obvious in the New Testament times, the early days of the Christian church, that they didn't preach in the manner that is customary with us, by taking a text out of the New Testament and <coughs> analyzing it and expounding it and then applying it, because they hadn't got the New Testament. Well, what did they preach? Well, they preached this great message that had been committed to them this great body of truth, this whole matter of salvation. And I'm arguing that that is what we should be doing always, though we do it through particular and individual expositions of particular texts. So I trust that I'm making clear this relationship between theology and preaching. There is one other general point that I'd make here before we leave this matter of the content of the sermon. And that is that we are to preach the gospel and not to preach about the gospel. Here is a, a very vital distinction. It's not always easy to put it in words. And yet it is a very clear thing. There are some men who think that they're preaching the Word when the whole time they're really saying things about the Word. Uh, I've always felt that that is the particular characteristic and indeed the snare of the Bartians. They're always talking about the Word, and saying things about the Word. But that isn't what we are called to do. We are called to preach the Word and uh, to present the Word and to bring the Word directly to people. We're not saying things about it, but we're actually conveying it itself. We are the channels and the vehicles through which this Word is passing to the people. Or another way I can put it is this. We are not called just to say things about the Gospel. I remember a type of preaching 50 years ago and more which was often described as praising the gospel. The comment on the sermon the preacher was that he had praised the gospel. He'd been saying wonderful things about it, uh, showing how wonderful it was. Now, I, I would again suggest that this is wrong. The gospel is wonderful. The gospel is to be praised. But that's not the preacher's primary task. He is to present the gospel. Or let me put it like this. The business of the preacher 
is not to present the gospel academically. This again can be done. He can analyze it and show its parts and portions and show how excellent it is. But here he is saying things about the gospel. Whereas we are called to preach the gospel, to convey it and uh, bring it directly to individuals who are listening to us and bring it, as I've been emphasizing it, to the whole men. So let's be clear then that we are not uh, referring to the gospel as something outside us as it were. We are involved in this. We are not looking on it as a subject and saying things concerning it or about it. It itself is being directly presented and conveyed to the congregation. And here it is important for me to emphasize once more that we must present the total gospel. There is a personal side to it, and that is right, and we must start with that. But we don't stop with it. There is a cosmic side as well. We must present the whole plan of salvation as it is revealed in the scriptures. We must show that the ultimate object, as the Apostle Paul puts it in Ephesians 1.10, is to head up again in Christ all things, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, all things in him. And uh, so we, we've, got to, we've got to do this, and that is why I think it's good that we should divide up our idea of preaching and of ministering in this way under the three uh, terms that I've put to you. And it is, of course, in that uh, third type of preaching, which I said is more instructional, that this element comes out, uh, where you are not preaching again evangelistically, nor are you dealing with these problems of the people, but you want them to see that they're part of this greater whole. But it isn't just something that I get, a nice feeling that I want, or peace, or whatever it is I'm seeking for. But all that is very important, and it's a part of it. But there's something much more important, that the whole universe is involved. And we must give the people a conception of this, of the scope and the ambit and the greatness of the gospel in this all-inclusive element. Now, every part, in other words, is a part of uh, this whole. And it is important that we should always be conveying that impression. It's, to me, always fascinating how this uh, particular characteristic of preaching comes out so clearly in the epistles of the Apostle Paul in particular, and I use this to bring home my point. You know how, in general, you can say that you can divide his epistles into two main sections. Having started with his preliminary salutation and so on, he then reminds these people of the great doctrines which they have believed. And having done that, about halfway through, he then introduces his great word, therefore, now he's going to apply this doctrine. He's saying, in the light of all this, which you claim to have believed, this is what follows. And he reasons with them as to how they should live, and so on and so forth. In other, in other words, the first half, speaking very roughly, of every epistle is doctrinal, and the second part is practical, or application. And yet, having said that, what is always so fascinating and to me thrilling and moving is to observe the way in which even in the practical section he keeps on bringing in the doctrine again. There is the general division, but you mustn't press it, I say. You mustn't make these divisions too absolute. You can't do this. The two, all these aspects are so intimately related that you've got to keep them going together the whole of the time. In other words, while there is preaching which is concerned to inculcate moral and ethical principles and the application of them to life, this must never be done in isolation. Take, for instance, how he opens out in the twelfth chapter of the Epistle to the Romans. I therefore beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies, etc. That's the appeal. It's, it isn't simply morality. 
This element comes in because of what we've already known and believed. So I say that while you recognize this kind of distinction, you don't press it. It's good for practical purposes, but never isolate these things. You're always saying the whole thing, as it were, but putting a particular stress and emphasis at a particular moment. And indeed, you will find this, that uh, though you set out with these ideas in your mind, that you'll often find that uh, what you proposed is not what really happens. I mean this, that uh, you will find that people who have listened to your more evangelistic preaching without having come under its power, without having been converted, may well be converted when you are preaching to the saints, as it were, and edifying the believers. These are the surprises that one gets, and later on I hope to show you how we ought to thank God for this. It's a part of the whole romance of preaching. You set out rightly to say, now I'm, this is to be an evangelistic service. And then the other one, well, I'm setting out now to edify the saints and to build them up in the faith. But suddenly you'll find that uh, men will be converted in the second type of sermon who wasn't in the first and so on. And somebody will be converted when you're even giving the more instructional portion. The wind bloweth where it listeth. We don't control this thing. But it is right and good that we should have this kind of system in our minds. Very well. We now come, therefore, to the form of the sermon. So far I've been dealing with the content of the sermon. And now we come to the form of the sermon. I'm free to confess that this is undoubtedly, in my opinion, the most difficult matter that I'll have to deal with while I'm having this privilege of speaking to you. It's the most difficult. But at the same time, I want to try to show you that it is also one of the most important, the form of the sermon. We are clear about the content, the subject, the matter. What about the form? Well, let's start with some negatives. A sermon is not an essay. That is something that needs to be said and said constantly because there are so many who clearly draw no distinction between a sermon and an essay. This is the, one of the points at which what I was referring to the, after, the other afternoon concerning the danger of printing sermons and reading them comes out most obviously. Why do I say that a sermon is not an essay? Well, I would say that by definition the style is entirely different. Uh, an essay is written to be read. A sermon is something that is to be listened to. Uh, in a, an essay, therefore, you look for literary elegance and particular form. Whereas, I suggest that that is not one of the primary considerations in a sermon. Uh, or it even is true in a matter like this. Repetition in an essay is bad, but I'm one of those who believes that repetition in a sermon is good and that it is a part of the whole essence of teaching and preaching that there should be repetition. It helps to drive the point home and to make it clear, but if you're reading an essay, this is something which is bad. Furthermore, an essay generally deals with a particular idea or a thought or a concept and plays with it and looks at it from different aspects. And the danger arises therefore with many preachers that they go to a text and just to, to get an idea, then once they've got this idea they say farewell to the text and the context and they proceed to write an essay on this idea that has been suggested to them by the reading of this verse or this passage. And then they proceed to write their essay, and then they enter into a pulpit and either read or recite the essay which they have so prepared. But uh, I'm here to suggest to you that that is not preaching at all. 
that really has very little to do with preaching. And very largely because there is no element of attack in it. If there is an element of attack in an essay, it's correspondingly a bad essay. The whole genius of an essay is that it plays with ideas, and on the whole, handles them rather lightly. And thus you have this elegant production, which is excellent literature, and delightful and enjoyable to read, but is not preaching. Uh, secondly, I assert that uh, preaching a sermon is not a lecture. And uh, once more, I say that this is something quite different. Uh, and for these reasons, that a lecture, again, starts with a subject. And uh, what it's concerned to do is to give knowledge and information concerning this particular subject. Its appeal is primarily and almost entirely to the mind. It's a matter of giving instruction. That's the function and the purpose of a lecture. Uh, so a lecture, again, does lack and should lack this element of attack, this concern to do something to the listeners, which I've already indicated is a vital part of preaching. But the big difference, I would say, between a lecture and a sermon is this, that a sermon does not start with a subject. A sermon is always expository. The theme or the doctrine is something that arises out of the text and its context. And it is something which is illustrated by that text and context. So the sermon doesn't start with a subject as such. It starts with the word of God, which has within it a doctrine or a theme. And then you proceed to deal with it in terms of this particular setting. Now, I'm laying down there for this proposition that a sermon is always to be expository. But immediately, that uh, leads me to say something that I regard as very important indeed in this whole matter. A sermon is not a running commentary or a mere exposition of the meaning of a verse or a passage or a paragraph. I'm emphasizing this because there are many today who have become interested in what they regard as expository preaching, but who show very clearly, as I see it, that they don't know what expository preaching is. They think it's just to make comments, have a running commentary on a paragraph or a passage or a statement. And they take it verse by verse and they analyze it and they make their comments and then they go on to the next verse and they do the same with that and then the next and so on. And when they've gone through the passage, they finished and they imagine that they've preached a sermon, but they haven't. All they've done is to give a comment on a passage. I would suggest to you that far from having preached a sermon, such preachers have only preached the introduction to a sermon. Now, this, in other words, raises this whole matter, you see, of the relationship of exposition to the sermon. And uh, my contention is that the characteristic of a sermon is that it has a definite form and that it is this form that makes it a sermon. It's based upon exposition, but it is this exposition turned into a message which has this characteristic form. Uh, the phrase that I always like in this connection is, a sermon to me is similar to what you read of in the Old Testament in the prophets when he talks about the burden of the Lord. It's come to him as a burden. It's come to him as an entire message. And he delivers this. Now that is something, you see, which is never true of an essay or of a lecture. And indeed it isn't true 
of a mere series of comments upon a number of verses. I am contending that a sermon is to have as much form as, say, a musical symphony. A symphony always has form. It has its parts and its portions. The divisions are clear and are recognized and they can be described. And yet, a symphony is a whole. You can divide it into parts, and yet you always realize that they're parts of a whole, and that the whole is more than the mere summation or aggregate of the parts. And I like to think of a, a sermon as a construction which is in that way comparable to a symphony. In other words, a sermon is not a, a mere meandering through a number of verses. It is not mere a mere collection uh, or series of excellent and true statements and remarks. All those are in the sermon, but they don't constitute a sermon. What makes a sermon a sermon is that it has this particular form about it, which differentiates it from everything else. Now, I got to turn aside for a moment here to uh, raise a question or to deal with a position. And I frankly confess again that I've often been very troubled by what I'm about to say. Uh, Edwin Hatch, in his Hibbert Lectures for 1888, I've quoted from them already, makes a great point of this. He contends that the early, earliest Christian preaching was entirely prophetic, that uh, it consisted of Christian people receiving messages through the Spirit and getting up and delivering them without uh, premeditation, thought, or preparation, and that uh, they certainly had no form, no sermonic form about them, but that they were isolated statements. Men spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. A message came to them. There are indications of this in 1 Corinthians 14, as you know, and in many other places, these prophetic utterances. And he goes so far as to suggest that that was original preaching. And further, that our idea of preaching and this idea of a sermon which I'm putting to you in particular is something that is foreign to the New Testament and uh, that it came into the Christian church and her preaching as the result of Greek influence upon the early church and especially during the second century familiar with the fact that the Greeks were interested in form. They were interested in form in everything. And they had become very interested in the form of their addresses or their speeches. They laid great emphasis upon this, that a man didn't just get up and speak, that the way in which he presented his matter was very important if he wanted to influence the people. And they had developed this method or this form of speech uh, which uh, is to be seen so generally in the sermon as it has been familiar in the long history of the Christian church. Well now I want to deal with this very briefly. I admit at once of course that there was a great element of truth in what he says. And one can see this pneumatic, this prophetic element clearly in the New Testament. But I still dissent from his ultimate verdict. And I believe that he is not quite true to the New Testament evidence. Um, I agree that we must always be careful, and this was the thrust of Hatch's teaching lest we impose this form upon the matter. 
and become more interested in the form than in the matter. It's a very real danger, this. The moment you have any kind of form, literally or any other, there is the danger of our becoming slaves to the form. And we become more interested in, what, in the way in which we are saying a thing than in the thing which we are saying. Now, all right, well, I'll, I'll accept all that. But still, I'm arguing that even on the New Testament evidence itself, that he's going too far. I would say that in the report of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, as you have it in Acts 2, that there is distinct form, that he didn't get up and make a series of isolated remarks, but there was a definite form about his sermon. In the case of, Phil uh, of, 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 of Stephen's self-defense before the Sanhedrin, as it is recorded in Acts 7, here I argue that there is most definite form, and what I would call the form of a sermon. There's a distinct plan, and he works it out and proceeds from step to step. He knew exactly where he was going to end before he began, but he leads on to it. You can't read Act 7 without being impressed by the form, the architecture of that famous address. And surely, when you read Paul's address in Antioch in Pisidia, as it's recorded in Acts 13, you find exactly the same thing. He was speaking to a plan, or if you prefer it, he'd got a kind of skeleton. There was this form to that address. Well, now then, that leads us to the question, having made those remarks in passing in defense of the sermon as I'm presenting it to you as against the criticisms of Hatch. And yet, again, I would say this, that we must <coughs> keep ourselves fluid on these matters. We mustn't become hardened. I think the history of the church and the history of preaching shows very clearly how all these things can be carried to excess, and they always lead to reactions, and the history of the church is so, uh, has been so much, hasn't it, excess and reaction to it, instead of holding to what seems to be the pattern of the New Testament itself. Very well. What is this for? Well, I I'm suggesting it's something like this. You start, you're preparing your sermon now. You start, therefore, with exposition of your passage or of your statement. This is essential, this is vital, as I've said, all preaching must be expository. You don't start with a thought. It may be a right thought, a good thought. You don't start with that and then work out an address or a sermon on this. We mustn't do this because if you do that, you will find that you'll be tending to say the same thing each time. You'll be repeating yourself endlessly. Uh, if there were no other reason for expository preaching, this to me would be sufficient in and of itself. It will preserve variety and variation in your preaching. It'll save you from repetition and it'll be a good thing for your people as well as for you. So, you must be expository and in any case, my whole argument is that it is to be clear to people that what we are saying is something that comes out of this book. We are presenting this and its message. Uh, that is why uh, I'm one of those who likes to have a pulpit Bible. And it should always be there and it should always be opened and a man should be preaching out of it. I've known men who just open the Bible to read the text and they've shut the Bible and put it on one side and then they go on talking. I think that's wrong in, in and of itself. We are to give the impression, it may be more important than anything we can say, that what we are saying is coming out of this and always coming out of it. This is its origin. This is where we have derived it. So you start with an exposition. Not only in your own preparation, you're going to give this to the people as well. Then uh, you derive your theme or your doctrine from this exposition. If you've expounded truly, you will arrive at a doctrine, a particular doctrine, which is a part of the whole. And it is your business indeed to search for this. 
and to seek for it. You've got to ask questions, and you've got to ask this question. What is this saying? What is the particular doctrine here? Then you make that known. You know, preparing your sermon. Having isolated your doctrine in this way, and having got it quite clear in your own mind, you then proceed to show the relevance of this particular doctrine to the people who are listening to you. In other words, uh, this question of relevance, you see, must never be forgotten. As I've said, you're not lecturing. You're not reading an essay. You are setting out to do something definite and particular to influence these people, the whole of their lives and their outlook. Very well then, you've obviously got to show the relevance of all this. You're not an antiquary uh, lecturing on ancient history or on uh, ancient civilizations or something like that. You're a man who is speaking to people who are alive today and confronted by the problems of life. And therefore, you've got to show that this is not some academic or theoretical matter which may be of interest to people who take up that particular hobby as others take up crossword puzzles or something else, you are here to show them that this is vitally important for them and they must listen for all their worth because this really is going to help them to live. Relevance for today. Then, having done that, you then come to the division of this matter into propositions or headings or heads, whatever you may like to call them. Now the object of these headings or divisions is to make clear this proposition. That's its object. But you see, there is a definite form to all this. As you were a great uh, comp musical composer, uh, in his introduction to his symphony or uh, in his overture to his opera, generally lets you into the secret of the various motives that he's going to take up. The light motives. He generally lets you have some conception of them in general in his introduction. But having done that, he then takes up number one, the first one he's hinted at. And that's your first division in your sermon. And so you divide up this matter in this way into a number of propositions. Now, the arrangement of these propositions or heads is a very important matter. You don't, uh, having divided up the matter and having seen its respective elements, you don't now utter these in any sort of order. No, no. You've got a, a doctrine. You've got an argument. You've got a case which you want to argue out and to reason and to develop with the people. Mm -hmm. So obviously you must so arrange your headings and your divisions in such a way that point number one leads to point number two and point number two leads to point number three. And if you have more points, well, you, each one goes on leading to the next. And ultimately you arrive at the conclusion. You see now in the light of all this, the whole thrust of this particular doctrine. Now I'm emphasizing therefore that there must be progression in the thought. That each one of these points is not independent and is not in a sense of equal value with all the others. It is a part of the whole, but you're advancing. You're taking the matter further on. You're not simply saying the same thing a number of times over. You are arriving at an ultimate conclusion. So, uh, to me, uh, as a part of the form of a sermon, the progression and the advance and the development of the argument and the case and the reason is absolutely vital. And you end on a climax. You lead up to it. And then the great truth should stand out there dominating everything that has been said and the people go away with this in their minds. But, as you've been doing this, and this is a vital part of the sermon, you have been applying what you've been saying as you go along. 
There are many ways of doing this. You can do it by question, question and answer, and various other forms. But you must apply it as you're going along, showing, you see again, that you're not just lecturing, that you're not dealing with an abstract or an academical or theoretical matter, but that it's a living matter and that it is con to concern them in the whole of their life and being. So you keep on applying it and then to make absolutely certain of this, when you've ended the reason and the argument and have arrived at this climax, you apply it. And you can apply it in the form of an exhortation. Again, this can be done by a series of questions or in various other ways and manners. But it is vital to the sermon that it should always end on this note of application or of exhortation. Now, there is my idea of the sermon, and that is what I mean when I am stressing this idea of the form. You see, you haven't stopped at mere exposition or explanation of the meaning. You've done that. You've got to do this. But what you are concerned to do now is to convey this whole message. In other words, a sermon is an entity. It is a complete whole. And this must always be true of a sermon. It must always have this completeness, this form to it. And this is particularly important if you should be preaching a series of sermons. You may preach a series of sermons on the, same tech, on the same text or on a particular passage. And oftentimes men make the mistake of, uh, as I say, more or less uh, making it a running commentary. Or indeed, even those who've got some idea of the form of a sermon may fall into this error. Uh, they, they won't be able to say all oh, that can be said on this in the one sermon. And so they will say, well, there it is. That's, that's all we can do this time. And uh, they stop at that. Now, I think that's bad. I think it is for us to see that every single sermon is rounded off, is complete, has this element in it. And what you do next time when you're go going on with the subject is, in, in a few sentences or a few brief moments, you sum up what you've already said and then you develop it. But make sure that this one again is an entity and is a whole and is complete in and of itself. I'm very concerned about this. I'm concerned for many, many reasons. One is obviously that there may be people there uh, who will not be there next Sunday uh, and who will go away disappointed and uh, wondering what you're going to say and so on. And Or the next Sunday people will not, uh, may be there, were not there the previous Sunday. And they'll feel, well, because I wasn't there last Sunday, I can't grasp this. That's why it's important that every sermon should be a complete entity. You must always preserve this form. In other words, I am arguing that there is in a sermon an artistic element. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is where, of course, the labor of preparing sermons comes in. You've got to put this into form. You've got to put it into shape. Uh, I imagine that the musical composer or the poet has to do this very thing. He's got certain general ideas, certain themes suggest themselves to him. But now he's out to produce a poem. And what he's got to do is to take all these ideas that have come to him and he's got to mold them into shape. He's got to get them into form. And this is where the effort and the labor come in. I hope to tell you when I come to the actual practical details of uh, preparing a sermon, uh, of how this happens sometimes and of some of the difficulties and how your problems are sometimes resolved in strange and unexpected manners. All I'm saying now is this, that it is our business as preachers to hammer out this matter, to get the form of a sermon. Now, why do you do this, says someone? Well, the answer is, it is because of the people who are going to listen. This is the thing the Greeks have discovered, and I believe rightly, that when truth is presented in this form, it is more easily assimilable by the people. 
it's easier for them to take it and to remember it and to understand it and to benefit from it. So you're not doing it merely because you believe in art for art's sake. The artistic element comes in for the sake of the people, for the propagation of the truth and the honor of the gospel. And I believe that uh, what I've been trying to say can be substantiated very clearly and evidently from the long history of the Christian church. The preaching which God through the Spirit has been most pleased to honor throughout the centuries has been preaching which has been based on these great sermons. The great preachers are men who prepare great sermons. But then you'll get up and say, but what about so-and-so who never could prepare a sermon at all, but he was greatly used of God? Exactly. That's the exception that proves the rule. And you don't legislate for hard cases. You don't build up your theory on exceptions. God can use anybody. God can use a man silencing. But we are called to be preachers and men who are to convey the truth. And my contention is that if you read uh, the great uh, preaching about the great preaching of the past or the great sermons, you will find that these are the ones that have been most honored by the Spirit and used of God in the conversion of sinners and in the upbuilding and edification of the saints of God. So we come to this, you see, that uh, we've got a sweat and labor, and it can be extremely difficult at times to get all this matter that you've got out of your scriptures into this particular form. It's like a potter making something out of the clay. Or it's like a blacksmith making the shoes for the horse. And you have to keep on putting it back into the fire and put it on the anvil and hit it again. And it's a bit better, but not quite right. Put it back again. This, this is a part of the preparation of a sermon. And uh, I want to show you it's a most fascinating thing and a most glorious occupation but it can be at times most difficult, most exhausting, most trying. But at the same time, I can assure you that when you finally got it, it is one of the most glorious feelings that ever comes to a man on the face of this earth. This completed thing, this entity, this form. Very well. The preacher must always start by preparing a sermon. I'm not dealing this afternoon with how he prepares it. I'm coming on to that. There are various ways of doing this, but he's got to prepare a sermon. He must have this entity, however he does it. This is where he begins. But let me remind you that this is only the first half. This is only the beginning. There is another side. What's that? Well, that is the actual preaching of this sermon, which he has so prepared. And as I hope to be able to show you, though you may go into the pulpit with what you regard as an almost perfect sermon, you never know what's going to happen to it when you start preaching, if it's <laughs> preaching worthy of the name. We do hope to go on to that next time. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.